Okay, elite strength coach Vince McConnell's here, and we're going to talk about things that change with training as you get older. I think this is a big one for a lot of people because some people are they're getting into their 50s and they notice that they just don't have their their body can't respond to the same training that they used to the way it used to. And then there's other people that are sedentary their whole lives and they're just starting to train in their 50s. And that's a totally different scenario. So let's let's get into both. But let's talk, let's start with you personally. You've been working out since you were a teenager. You're 57 now. What did you find changed as let's say let's start with what happened? What changes occurred when you got into your 40s? Um, well, I noticed that you could not do the thing long you could in your earlier years and get away with it. It's kind of like life in general. When you're younger, you're able to get away with some things in all aspects of life yeah. and back, back and, and get a second chance and a third chance and so forth. And then as you get older, you realize that one, that's where my quote, you know, one bad, one great workout doesn't make you one bad workout can break you. Yeah. And the thing yeah. is that when you're younger, you ignore that because you just bounce right back. You know, you, you, um, you know, whether it's mechanical technique, doesn't matter what it is, um, not recovered. Um, you know, not getting enough rest, you know, across the board, you can make all those mistakes when you're younger and typically still be able to train and bounce back and not have the consequences as you get into your thirties. And for me, it was more like my mid thirties that I started to notice that it took me longer to recover. And like we mentioned, um, before we started recording, I was a big barbell squatter, loved the exercise. It was something that I based all of my training around. And because of that, um, I would make sure that I rested on the day before. I didn't do anything crazy as far as whether it was somebody said, hey, can you help me move this <laughs> furniture? I'm like, oh, no, no, tomorrow's squat day. <laughs> the point is I planned my whole yeah. – uh, back. Yeah. To, you know, we had the dimetrodine um, 25 that we would take and everything. I mean, all the things to get hyped up so I could, right. move, I could move more weight. And I remember very clearly in my 30s, um, I don't know, obviously remember the exact day, but I remember the point in time in my training where I was like, this hurts. This, yeah. my body's not recovering. And as I mentioned to you, I don't have good mechanics for the squat, um, you know, with a long torso and short femurs. But because I want, it was important to me and I wanted to be good at it. And I played other, played sports all my life and I prided myself on that. And I was not a good bench presser. So I think part of it was the fact that I compensated of not being a good bench presser and thinking, okay, I'm going to be, a, I'm going to beat everybody in the squat. And I think we, you know, you and I can both relate to how important that aspect is. The yeah. when you or the ego, um, when you're committed to training, it's it's like you're trying to compensate for maybe something you're not great at, and you try to make up for it in another area. But I noticed that my body was not recovering, Mike. You know, from the from the squatting number one, and then it got to where I was really, literally going into a workout hoping. I didn't get hurt and then it wasn't fun anymore. And, yeah. and it was like, you know, cause literally it was like, wow, I survived that. Um, I don't want to have to do this again. I was not looking forward to my next workout. And that's the thing about commitment. Um, you know, and, and again, this is going to go up on a rabbit trail, but the thing about what we're going to, one of the things we're going to talk about is how important that training is to all aspects of your life in the sense of where you're not only, learning from your workouts that you can apply principles in all aspects of life. But then it also is something that helps you not only to learn those principles, but to apply them in the way that they carry over. Commitment is a big part of that, but also the discipline to know when to peel it back, when to go, okay, this is not productive for me, or this may be effective, but it's not productive for me. So you reel it back. And so that's a different level of maturity than those that go, well, you need to push through. You need to, no matter what, you need to have the discipline to just, you know, tell your body to shut up and you just keep pounding in that. So in my thirties, I began to understand that aspect. And then you're talking about that when you, what did you, what do you do now in, in place of barbell squats? Do you use the hip belt squat? Have you ever used that? Yes, I have. I, I've used I love that. that machine. I don't have one of those now, like a pit shark or something like that. And that's a hip dominant move for me because I tend to be the way that I squat. Obviously, I've been moving a lot of weight with my type of, you know, my, my long torso. I tend to be a, a butt squatter or a hip squatter, even with good form, you know, so I tend to lean forward a little bit 
more than and so it doesn't affect my quads as much that's a great movement for me but it's all hip dominant what i'm doing now is a lot of single leg work number one and and anybody that says you can't train your legs intensely one leg at a time they've never done it in in, in reality they've never done it the right way they've maybe done a bunch of lunges and stuff like that and i'm not talking about lunges for it's training. actually the best way to do it because you get you address imbalances it's actually the best way to train your legs you you do, but then I also found this aspect. And again, we're going off on another trailer, but I'll, I'll, I'll peel it back. Um, I find that the stronger you get in the single leg work, eventually there's a, a higher risk to the single leg work, even mm -hmm. putting less stress on your spine. And everybody goes, well, single leg work, you can't get hurt. Yeah, you can, because your body, once again, will find little ways of adjusting to move more weight. Right. And, and then you have pelvic issues lower back and hip issues and, and again things that unfortunately or fortunately unfortunately it's a point in time i did on i did experience and then i realized that you can't just rely purely on single leg work one of the variations that i use for my quadriceps because my my glutes my hamstrings have always been dominant for me personally this is something anybody can learn from and apply so I need to, to be more quad dominant. I have to choose exercises that address the quadriceps more. I'm not just talking about leg extensions, leg extensions, single joint movement, open. Okay, it is what it is, but it, we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about a squat. And one that I found, I love the pendulum squat as an example. Pendulum squat is awesome. If you've got a machine, which I've had in my facilities over the years, so great. I don't have one now. I've had to rig one. And this was inspired by... Doug Rignola, who unfortunately passed a friend of mine in the last couple of months, mm -hmm. um, biomechanics, brilliant guy with biomechanics. And through our conversations and through the materials that he was putting out, he came up with this, what he called a pendulum sissy squat. And I have several videos up on my social media with me performing the exercise. And it's basically a, a sissy squat. Now, the bad thing about a sissy squat in its pure sense is that you're overloaded in the bottom part of the strength curve where you're at, you know, your, your greatest risk to right. get hurt, especially if you're adding load in which right. you eventually need to, you know, body weight for most people will not be enough forever. And so he came up with an idea of putting a chain around your back or, a, um, in, in, the, in his case, I think it was, a, um, a climber's harness, which I use, a, um, a dipping belt and you attach it in front. And so you're, you're going kind of in a swing pattern, just like you would in a pendulum. It's a pendulum. And you're able to perform you know, technically a sissy squat because your tibia is going forward in relation to the, um, the um, line of gravity. So you're actually getting more load on your quadriceps. Tibia is the primary lever of the quadriceps. So when you're squatting, if you want to emphasize the quadriceps more, you want the tibia to go forward more. Some people naturally do that. Good example is Tom Platts. If you watch Tom Platts when he right. squats the bar, everybody says, oh, well, Tom Platts built his legs with the squat. No doubt about it. But he was he had the perfect mechanics yeah. for quads when he squatted. I mean, he's straight up and down. There's no forward lean or anything. Oh, yeah. I, I do what you do with, with the hip belt squat, not to the same degree, but I try to mimic what you just described. Because with the hip belt, the hip belt squat machine, you're holding on to two bars in front. So that allows me to fall back. When I when I descend, I literally feel like I'm going to fall back, and I'm using the bars to hold in place. Now that allows me to really sit back, stay way more upright than I would when I do barbell squats. It almost looks like a deadlift. I tend to shift over a lot, so it's more a hybrid of a dead, not a deadlift, but a good morning and a squat. Which is why I found that my body is mechanically suited really well for deadlifts. I don't get any benefits from the squat for deadlifts because it's basically almost a different variation of the deadlift, the way I squat. And I, I thought about this when Christian Thibodeau the other day talked about why the deadlift's not a good move for his mechanics, for the exact opposite reasons that the squat's not a good move for my mechanics. So he's a really good squatter. He's shorter, stockier. But he says when he deadlifts, because his legs are pretty short, he, has to, he gets into a really pronounced squat position at the start. And that can actually put a lot of pressure on your back because you don't hinge as much. So he found that there's no benefit for him doing deadlifts because it's basically just a bastardized version of the squat for him. He's better off just doing squats. I'm actually in the exact opposite situation of him. There's no real benefit for me doing barbell squats 
for the same reason why there's no real benefit for him doing barbell deadlifts. So where I'm going with this is that sometimes people feel, what are the best exercises that I can do? We get that question all the time. There's, there's no best, there's no one best exercise for everybody. You know, there's people that are really good at squats. They, they will talk all day about how everyone should do squats. But the part they're leaving out is that 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 lift is mechanically suited for their body type. So they're naturally really good at it. Of course, they're going to be saying, hey, everybody should do this. But if you're a strength coach, you have to look at you don't you don't just look at what works best for you. You have to look at someone else's mechanics and realize, OK, this works for me, but it's not necessarily going to work for others. The mistake a lot of trainers make is they put everybody on the same program that they do. <laughs> and, and the, because they don't they don't have enough sophistication and knowledge to go beyond that. Like a lot of these Instagram influencers, like here's my workout. OK, well, first of all, half the time, I don't even believe that's their workout. Let's start there. But the other thing is, so what? So what if that's your workout? It's not going to work for everybody watching. Yeah, well, the thing is, personal preferences will always play a role in training. The only time it doesn't is if you're in a sports environment, you know, where you're with a team, you have to do. Right particular program when you're training and you're designed I don't care if you're Jay Cutler or if you're everybody less than that yeah. you go with your preferences you go with what works what clicks with you and a lot of that is not always the, the physical aspect but the psychological aspect you know again we go back to why did I squat so much in my in my 20s and 30s it's because it wasn't because it felt great for my body it did work I mean I developed decent lower body because of it in all aspects and it definitely improved my performance now could i've gotten the same benefit without it and doing like a trap bar variation or something I, you know maybe i mean but the point is i psychologically had this relationship with the barbell squat that it it drove me to to be passionate even more so about all aspects of my training and my nutrition um, the way that i structured my training and everything until it didn't, until I, like I said, until that light came on and I'm like, I can't keep doing this, but there's no way I'm going to continue. I'm not going to train. I'm going to continue to train. So I'll, you know, and I've done leg press variations. I've done the hack squat machines and things like that. And they, this never, it's not the same feeling you get from doing a barbell squat. Right. Um, the other thing that I've used over the years is the, is the Frank Zane leg blaster. They, again, you've probably seen in some of my that's videos. Awesome. Yeah. That's an awesome device. That, that's a really good variation for, emphasizing your quadriceps now you can't right. use much weight but that's the whole point because you're not having to you're not having to compensate for um you know not non-optimal if you will mechanics for the quadriceps by adding more load in other words you can add more load with a vertical tibia when you're squatting that's why power lifters at least the competitive good ones they squat with their tibia as close to vertical as possible and turn it almost it looks almost like a good morning Right. Not saying it's bad form, but it allows them to move more weight from point A to point B. It's a matter of, of mechanics, it's physics. Right. And so when you're going, well, what if I want to develop my quadriceps? I want to prioritize my quadriceps. Well, then you have to change your way of thinking about the exercise. You don't quit squatting. You find a squat variation. For instance, you can take the trap bar. And this is another good one for anybody that doesn't have access to anything other than a trap bar and a slant board. Do a slant board trap bar squat meaning you're upright with your torso on a slant board and and you come all the way down with the slant board it's going to give you more range of motion than if you didn't have the board because you're you're elevated unbelievable quadriceps stress for somebody that says barbell squats i can't do them anymore like i used to but i'm going to keep training what should i do that's a really good transition to go with the trap bar and keep your torso upright while you're on a slant board. That's a really cool variation. I've done that before. Going back to your point about how obsessive you are with the squat. Now, when I listen to that, I see that as a good thing, and here's why. It's, it's whatever gets you excited about training is what you should focus on. So if I tell someone these are the five moves you should work on and they go into each workout dreading it, going, oh, God, I got to do that again. They're just dreading it. You're not going to be able to sustain that and you're not going to get good at any of those motions. I, I, I'm, I, my, any program I'm on, there's always one move that I'm obsessed about and then everything else is supplemental. Last time we spoke 2020, it was the deadlift. I remember talking to you about how I'm chasing this 605 deadlift. So that was every morning I woke up, I go, that's the, uh, what am I going to do today that's going to further that goal? So I went in obsessed with that. Once I hit that, 
I start thinking, okay, maybe I can do 650, maybe I can work up to 700. But the problem is the passion I had to get to 605 wasn't there anymore. You know, now I'm thinking I don't want to go through all that because it's really hard on your body. It's like I don't want to go through all that. It's the, the, the cost to benefit ratio wasn't favorable at this point. Now, fast forward to 2023, I'm very obsessed about Nordic curls. So that's what I'm thinking about all the time. And this is a great move. It's not hard on your body. It's really good for your knees. And it's a really impressive move in general, and it's fantastic for your hamstrings, which carries over to any form of athleticism. But my knees have never felt better, and that's just working on negatives, partials, working my way up to, I wanna do five complete, really clean looking reps on it by the end of the year. Okay, now I could probably do one if I wanted to, but you know what? A month ago, I couldn't even do one rep. I couldn't even lower under control. So these are all progressions. But my point is, is that this move gets me excited to train. It's not the only thing I do. I still do deadlifts. I do kettlebell presses. I do other things. I go to the gym. But this is the move that gets me excited. So I think with any program anyone follows, if it doesn't excite you, there's something missing there. There has to be something in it that's important to you. Yeah, in everything you just said, it gets back to you need at least one. If it's not an exercise, it needs to be an objective. That's a trigger. In other words, it's one that you can fight now. I'll say this, you don't want all of the exercises you do to be those because you can't prioritize. I mean, right. that's a moron. You can't prioritize. Me one. <laughs> it has to be more than one. You really can't get up. It's like if I'm going, okay, look, I'm going to work on the Nordic curl. I'm going to work on improving my kettlebell press to a new PR. I'm going to work on getting my deadlift to 650. And then I'm going to work on a PR at the, the hip belt squat machine at the gym and the leg press. It's too many things. It's too many things you're trying to do at once. Because the thing is, even if you physically could do that, psychologically, you get burned out. And that's a very good thing there. Is that you've got to psychologically remain fresh. Right. Training to be productive. And and that and that means and, and the thing is where I when I'm discussing this topic with with people that are very dedicated to their training, very. I'm fortunate enough that I work with a lot of professional people, meaning physicians, attorneys that that are that use their training as that when I say outlet, they take it probably as serious as they do their their line of work or their career. It's um you know they don't go hunting and fishing and play golf and all this is that that's what they do. Those are the types of clients that I personally attract, which I'm I'm fortunate about that. And at the same time, I've had to learn how to deal because I'm that way. So I've so in essence, I can't just train them like you said. I can't just train them the same way that I train. I have, but I have to learn from my mistakes and from my tendencies. As an example, if you were to tell someone that's a Type A, and and say they are, you know, a a, a high end surgeon where their every move that they make in their in their career is 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 accounted for, and they're and they're coming in to train. You can't tell them that moderation is the key because that that's not going to click with them psychologically. You've got to find a way to use that commitment, but then also regulate the the nervous system, regulate the way that their body recovers, because they're also the type that cannot afford not being able to train. You know, right. whether they're sick, whether they get injured, you know, those are the things too. So it's the, the balance is those personalities are driven and you got to already know okay the commitment's not the problem that's not or not the issue i don't have to worry about getting them to understand the need to be consistent the need to to i mean if i told them to give 100 percent every workout that they would do that not that we do but the point is is that the effort the commitment is not the problem so what you have to do is find ways of reeling that in without patronizing them without without it coming across as hey we're going to do a deload because that the word deload does not exist to people like that got to you've got to look at it from the standpoint of this is our priority now i'm going to put the other things the smaller rocks we're going to focus on the big rocks i'm going to put the smaller rocks in that so they do feel a sense of accomplishment with every workout as opposed to feeling like they're just showing up and punching the clock and all that, because then you'll lose them. You're not not losing necessarily as a client, but you'll they'll lose the desire, the passion. So if it is say the deadlift, you prioritize that and you make sure that you're putting the other things in there to support that particular exercise. The other exercise, like the 
Nordic curl, other exercises, you know, obviously for the upper body, but you make sure that they're recovering. In other words, you, it's your job, you know, and then most people, they don't have a trainer saying so they're, you know, okay, well, how do I apply this in my own life? You don't, if you have a passion for a certain exercise, find a way to be able to manage the workload and continue with that exercise until say you hit a PR, maybe right. you don't want a PR and you just want to be able to do it all that frequently to two right. times consistently. Also, you got to understand that you don't want to have to quit. You don't want to have to get knocked out by getting injured. You don't want to, or, you know, again, you know, having to take time off. So that's um, the commitment part is not the issue. It's the maturity to be able to understand your training enough to where you realize I'm going to stop this side of falling off the cliff. Okay. The, the view over the cliff is great, but it's a lot better when you didn't get too far over than right. when going down it. Right. So, that, so it's the same symbolic aspect with training is that you don't say, well, you should never do this. You should never do that. You should never squat. It'll compress your spine. It'll, I mean, those are all facts for some people, but if it's something that really like you with the deadlift, if it just really is that trigger that drives all aspects of your training, then you want to make sure that you're doing the other exercises that support that yeah. and that you're able to also recover from. And now you're more, you're more motivated to do those supplementary moves too, because it's leading to the goal that you care about. Exactly. So if there are three or four moves that I'm not excited about, but I know psychologically that they're going to improve what I do care about. Now I'm motivated to do those things. Now it's gonna. Now it's gonna be just part of the execution. So that makes a lot of sense. What do you recommend for recovery? Yeah. What do you have your people do for? Do you have your people? You recommend anything special for recovery, such as massages or? You know, that's something that I wait until they ask me what I think of something more than it is I give them you know, like every client. Because again, it goes back to the personality of the person. You know, cry cryotherapy for certain clients. They thrive on it. Now, I could show them, hey, it's maybe not that effective if you do it all the time or you do it regularly. Massage therapy obviously is a foundational modality to use for recovery. Some people just, for whatever reason, they're, they just get put off by, you know, having somebody put their hands on them and work on them. I mean, it's, kind of, you know, I'm just like with chiropractors. Some people, yeah thrive on going to their chiropractor on a regular basis. Other people, if you mention the word, they immediately think something negative or because that experience or one that someone else had. So in answer to your question, there's, I always make this clear. Recovery is essential. It's essential. It's not something that, you know, is important for some people, not important for other people. How you go about it can have different branches and you've got to find what works for you and be consistent with it though, because the only way you, you know something's working is if you're consistent. If you go cryotherapy one time in, you know, in June and you go, oh, it was awesome, man. You know, my body felt so great. And then you don't go back. I mean, you know, it's like, okay, well, then how do you know if that type of therapy is helping your recovery? Same thing with massage therapy. It needs to be a consistent thing. Um, you know, you need to find someone that you trust, someone because they get to know your body and you know this very well, you know, um, they get to know your body, you get to know them. And then because the whole point of, of an effective massage is being able to relax. Yeah. And first few times you're going to naturally, because it's new, be more anxious, uh, more up, you know, uptight over certain areas of your body. And it's certainly the ones that, you know, need the most work yeah. and fight the massage the entire right. time. Like with the chiropractic adjustment, you know, it's not going to be for the effective for you. And you're going to have a bad experience with it. So you got to give it time. Don't just go one time and go, well, it didn't work. You go and you, you know, um, be able to connect enough with the massage therapist to know so they know your body and, and so forth, because it does. It is a relationship in the in, in that in the most professional way. Um, it is one that you um, that can be invaluable, especially whether it's a your professional athlete, you're a professional in general, or um, you're just someone that just hey, I love training. I want my body to recover. Obviously, we get into nutrition and rest and, you know, that. But the modalities of massage therapy, it's like uh, cryotherapy. Um, some people use light therapy. There's all kinds of different things. Yeah. You can be consistent long enough to know if it's working for you. 
I'll tell you what, I did an experiment. I read, I read about the benefits of massage for sports recovery when I was in college. Of course, I didn't have any extra money to spend on something like that, but I made a psychological note of down the line, I wanted to do an experiment where I get a massage once a week and see what impact it has. And I found a really good therapist here in Vegas. I started going to her in 2014. I go, okay, she's pretty good. So let me commit to her once a week. At the end of every training week, I'm going to get a massage from her. And I'm telling you, it made a huge impact on training performance. Huge. Once a week was tremendous because what she did was break down all that damage I created that week. So I'm not going into the next week with the accumulation. I have a reset point. So most people, they're just training week, week after week. They're building up inflammation. They're building up damage. And then eventually it hits a tipping point and you get injured and it derails your progress. So going to her, though, allowed me to get everything that I broke down fixed before I go into the next week. And it made a huge difference. Now, I don't go as often anymore because I'm not training as intensely as I did then. So now I find once every two weeks is sufficient. But if I really want to dial things up, start doing a lot of heavy deadlifts and other things again frequently, once a week makes a big difference. So I encourage people to try these things. But like you said, if I'm telling someone to go get a massage and they hate the experience every time and they're looking like, oh, man, I got to go get another massage on Friday and they're just dreading it. Because I'll tell you what, a sports recovery massage is a lot different than a relaxation massage. You go to the spa with your wife or something like that. You get on vacation. You're getting a nice little rub down. That's not what I'm talking about. The massages I get, they hurt because she's ticking her elbow and breaking down all that inflammation. It's almost like rolfing. Now, this is not something I look forward to, to be honest, because I know it's going to be painful. But I also know I need it. The only reason it's painful is because there's a lot of damage. If there's no pain, there's no damage. There's no real reason to go. But like you said, I like your point is it, it has to be something that you're going to be consistent with. Because if you just get a massage once and then you never go back, that's useless. If you go to a crowd chamber once, you never go back. you got to do a crowd chamber at least twice a week for three months to assess whether it actually works for you. Yeah, and that's and the thing is you mentioned about the massage being a real aggressive form of therapy. And, and that's another thing that some people just they can't handle it or, you know, I mean, there are cases that people go to a massage therapist and they're really not qualified. That particular therapist may be, be certified, but yeah. they just can't get deep enough yeah. because it's a workout for them. I mean, it's it's very demanding. And then so their experience as well, I didn't really feel like it helped me because so. Um, in a case like that, if you if you went to like you said, if you went to a massage therapist for sports massage and you felt like it was just um, you know helped you relax and you fell asleep and you know drooled all over yourself and then you know you didn't feel any effect and you probably didn't go to the one that they may be great for somebody else but that's not the best one for you. Go to one that it's very aggressive and they know how to not just destroy you the first time, but the same at the same time it's not comfortable. It's in that. What massage therapy, I like to look at it, Mike, is that it's removing the restrictor plates in our body. Because our body, even when it gets injured to a large extent, it's trying to protect itself. So when it's tight someplace, it's it literally is, I mean, it's, it's something that you can't force it to loosen up. And that's where a lot of people think they can do it on their own and they'll do nothing but say stretching and they'll force the stretch. And they're saying, hey, I'm doing mobility every day. And like I say about mobility, if if your mobility work is only just letting you know how tight you are every time you do it, it's not working. Right. It's right. Some, some change. You need it to be where you're, you're getting some progress with that. And so massage therapy will do that as well. And, and the thing is, is that you, when you mentally look at it as my body has some natural restrictor plates that occur from my training that are really trying to prevent... A, a serious injury and I need to let it know it's okay. I need to, I need to, you know, by letting my nervous system communicate with my muscle and with my skeletal structure that, Hey, it's, it's okay to release that area. It's okay to, if you're tight adductors, as an example, your psoas is something that's very common for people. They don't realize how important the psoas muscle is. It's possibly the most important skeletal muscle in your body because it affects so much of digestion across the board. And people go, well, what is the psoas? Oh, it's just a hip flexor. And no, it's much, much more than that. It's very deep. And to be able to get in there on your own is it, it requires a special type of human being to be able to do that because it's very uncomfortable. Yeah. And a massage therapist that can do that and is willing to get down in that area 
deep enough is something that requires them some, you know, some special, not just knowledge, but some special experience, you know, being a, working with a vast array of, um, of, of customers or clients that they've had, you know, because it's, it, that's one area as an example, your cat, obviously that's not comfortable to do on your own. I mean, there's so many things that you really just can't just, just I'm going to roll it out and, you know, mas- you know, massage it with the foam roll, uh, you know, smash it with the lacrosse ball. I right. used to, I used to think all that was the solution too, and then you finally realize that all you're doing is going to the same place every time. Yeah, you know. So, yeah, I recommend if everybody can find a massage if you're willing to look at it, find a massage therapist and then develop that that consistency so you can develop a relationship with them so they understand your body and where you are tight or where there's imbalances and so forth. I would recommend that people go to ActiveRelease.com and look for an Active Release practitioner in their area because they're very well trained. I go to a guy named Dr. Kyle Booth here in Vegas, and he his I hate to just minimize what he does as an active release technique because he's skilled in so many other facets, but he is a very high level ART practitioner as well. Now, this is a form of physical therapy that I have found extremely effective, and I've gone to ART practitioners all over the country since 1999, probably. Out of all of them, the guy I go to now, Dr. Booth, he's by far the best. I've had many different injuries that would have been serious ones and very very long term to recover from that he was able to address very quickly i mean i hurt my back the other day doing hip belt squats of all things my legs were just weren't positioned right and i had this real like a rib popped and i had this pain on my left side that was i couldn't even turn in that direction or i had to sleep without turning and all that it was super painful now if i just sat around waiting for it to go away i would still have it right now But I went to him immediately. The next day I went to him. He worked on it, 50% reduction in pain in one session. By the time I saw him again earlier this week, 100% gone. I'm back into training now, 100%. No pain whatsoever on that side. I had a groin tear back in 2019. It wasn't super serious where it just came off completely, but it was super painful. I mean, crazy painful. I went to him again immediately the next day. A small reduction in pain. Now, this one was more serious. This one took a couple of weeks to recover from where I could get back into training. But my point is, is that what a lot of people do in this situation is they do nothing. They just become sedentary. They're like, okay, I'm just going to wait for this pain to go away. It's not going to heal properly when you just wait for it to go away. You have to get treated by a qualified person. I'm not talking about the medical care where they're just going to give you a bunch of drugs and painkillers and send you on your way. That's not useful either. That's completely ineffective. But having someone that's an active release technique practitioner on speed dial when you have an injury, because the faster you get the injury addressed, the better. You don't want to let that thing sit in. So I I encourage everyone to go to activerelease.com, find a practitioner in your area. Even if you don't have an injury right now, make an appointment with that person, go through an assessment just so you have a relationship. And if you have an inevitable injury at some point, you can contact this person and get in there as soon as possible. Yeah. You you just nailed it with active release. Um, Ironically, my landlord is an ART practitioner oh, yeah. <laughs> next door to me too. And so um, the number of clients that I have that are patients of his um, is, is significant for that same exact reason that you just mentioned it. And the thing is, for anybody that goes, like we mentioned about chiropractic care, they go, and he's also a chiropractor, but the point is, is that there are a lot of people that just have a yeah, you know, just for whatever reason, they're they're um, they're hesitant to go to a chiropractor, and they don't want to get cracked, so to speak. They'll go to they'll go to him for active release, and as you mentioned in that last statement, go proactively first. In other words, don't wait till something's wrong. Find one and go, and let them make an assessment. Because, in my opinion, they're the best at making assessments that help me as a strength coach, as a personal trainer, that gives me information that I can apply in their training. And so that that is it, it's way better than, you know, say a, a structured FMS or something like that as far as an assessment goes, because they can do things that I can't get in a in a um, in a school. So as Mike just as you just said, Go online, find out where there's one close to you. It's worth the three and a half hour, four hour drive. Um, it, it, I mean, way beyond um, anything else I can think of from the standpoint of orthopedic or anything like that. And if you do have an issue and you are able to then 
to go to them after they've made the assessment and they understand, you know, your particular makeup and body and so forth. The path to recovery is is greatly diminished as far as the the time it takes. I mean, even in a day, somebody can wake up with a a shoulder where they slept on it wrong and they can't, you know, even raise it up over their head. They go for one session and it's like it's like a the miracle worker. It, it, it brings up and they go off to like a completely different person than I did 10 minutes ago. Yeah. I mean, it's that effective. And that goes right back to that same thing that often it's impairments that not injuries that need to be addressed. Right. You don't look like I'm injured because as soon as you say I'm injured, and especially when you look at it from the medical community, you're, you hear MRI, X-ray, right. Right. and it gets into your head. And then psychologically, it's a defeatist mindset from there. And, right. and and that that's a very real part of people recovering from you know the typical things the injuries that you get from from training i mean it's something that psychologically you if you think i'm i'm done you you know or i've got you get the diagnosis you get i mean whatever it is you're going to end up identifying with that and then it just lingers whereas if you can go say to an active release um, technician who can release that area and then you just go and get it back to its normal function then then you, you never have that identity you never have that label so to speak you know of like okay i've got a you know torn t- again we're not being in denial that there are things that happen but my point is the major overwhelming majority of the time it's more impairment than it is injury yeah that's a good way to frame it that's a really good way to frame it because people hear injury they think i need to go to a doctor a medical doctor i need to go to the hospital which may be useful, but more often than not, if it's an impairment, as you said, it's not going to be useful because that's not their area of expertise. Like, look, if you're in a serious car accident, yeah, you need to go to a doctor. You need to go to the hospital. And it's probably not going to just, you're probably not going to get what you need from an ART practitioner at that point, at least not initially. But there, there's levels to this thing. And also staying ahead, not waiting for an injury to happen, I think is really important. That's why I like to get those massages regularly because I also get some feedback on, hey, you're really tight in this area. You're, you're really tight over here. And that lets me start thinking about, okay, what am I doing wrong? How do I modify things? You don't wait for it. Like, look, it's like, it's like with car maintenance. Someone who's smart, you get your car taken care of every once in a while. You don't wait until you're on the side of the road waiting two hours for AAA to come save your ass when you could have just made sure that you got your oil changed regularly, you made sure the fluids were solid, you check your tires every once in a while, make sure there's enough air in there. There's very simple pro- proactive things you can do to avoid the hassle of needing serious car repairs down the line. Yeah, proactive. Um, a proactive mindset is possibly the most important aspect someone can have to be successful at any area of their life. And so that's, it goes right back to what we were talking about. You had a post a week ago talking about you know some of the things in your personal life that you um, had to go through recently and and how important that being proactive in your training allowed you to be able to um not eliminate those things but to to be able to manage the uh, the challenges in life and that and so much of that is it goes right back to you know, it's applicable in day-to-day training with being proactive and taking care of your body as well as being proactive and um, nourishing your body. Don't wait till you're dehydrated to drink, you know, as an example, because machines have human qualities, but humans are not machines. And that's, and that's something that a lot of people just, they, they think in terms of, it's all about just being, you know, a person that's got all kinds of, it's always going to have problems. And it's about me, you know, I mean, in other words, why, why eat good? Everybody's going to get sick. Everybody's going to, you know, so-and-so that ate this way and they, they didn't lose weight. I know this person, you know, they always have excuses of, you know, why something doesn't work. And then yeah. you have the side of it that goes, that looks at it purely from the machine standpoint and goes, human beings are machines and you have to treat them that way. Well, it's a combination of both. Yeah. You've got, anytime you've got the ego involved, you know, it, it takes, it goes beyond a machine. I mean, in other words, if you put a, if you take, if you had a machine and its capacity was 400 pounds and you put, 700 pounds on it or say even 550 on it it's going to fail right do the same thing to a person they're going to do their darndest to try to lift it i mean they're going to find ways to shift they're going to do whatever and that happens in training a lot where people overshoot their workload they overshoot what they should be doing um, weight wise load wise especially as you get older 
instead of letting your body determine the load that you need, you're you're trying to you're letting the load determine what your body needs to do to survive it. And in essence, you're trying to train it like you would, but the body is beyond a machine. So it's going to find a way to make that adjustment, which often leads to an injury. Right. But you make that that shift and you wonder, you know, how did that happen? You know, I, I did. All I did was add 20 pounds today. And, you know, and that well, the thing is, you're you shouldn't have been adding 20 pounds. You, you should have been taking 20 pounds off because your mechanics needed to be needed to be shored up. And and that's something, again, that a machine won't do that. A machine will only lift what it can. Right. Whereas a human being always tries to surpass itself. And the mindset with most people is, yeah, but if I don't push myself, myself then I'm not getting anything done. You know, the go heavy, go home, you know, mentality. That, so it's that moniker. But you don't hear people that end up getting injured to the point where they can't train saying the go heavy or go home. You know, they're like just glad to be able to. Some of my best workouts you know, again, using me as an example, and I'll say this with my clients too, when they come back after some type of an injury is their best workouts. And when they come back and they're just glad to be back training, yeah. and they, they take the expectation of how much they should be lifting away. And they'll say things like, I haven't felt that muscle to that degree ever when I was doing that, uh, whether it was a dumbbell press or whatever. I mean, it doesn't matter. It could be the same exercises we've done, but they're amazed at how just getting back, doing the exercise correctly, mechanically sound, and not being concerned with how much they're moving. Now, the other side of that, that you don't go to the other extreme either and go, okay, I've got the, you know, the five pound pink dumbbells. And as long as I'm, you know, picking those up, you said the amount of weight doesn't matter. So yes, it does. The amount of load matters. The specific amount does not. So in other words, it's got to be heavy. It's got to be challenging to your body, you know? So when somebody goes just the blanket statement, don't worry about how much weight you lift, just mind muscle connection focus. There's a lot of truth to that, but it's still a lot. You know, it's still, you still have to load the muscle. You still have to load the tissue. You still need mechanical tension. You mechanical tension is the most, as we know, is the most important aspect for muscle growth, but it's going to be different for different people. It's not always going to be the same. I mean, uh, 200 pound or 225 on a bar for somebody, you know, could be 315 for somebody else. And they look almost the same. I mean, they look the same, same age and all that. And you go, okay, well, what's right. what is here? Um, you know, they've been training the same amount of time. They've been, it's just, again, it's what is heavy in a genuine sense, not in a, you know, oh, I don't want to go heavier than 225, but literally where you go, I don't need more load than that right now. I mean, that's, that's all I need to get, to have the challenge and get to proximity to failure yeah. in that particular set. Yeah, you don't know if the technique is working unless the weight is heavy enough. So it's a, it's a, there's a, there's two points here. One, when you're going really heavy, you can't work on technique because your whole focus is on moving the weight. You can't sit there and look at every, break down every nuance of it. Now, if it's too light, sure, you can really focus on technique, but if it's, if it's so light, it's not gonna carry over to anything heavier. So it has to be that middle ground. Using myself, for example, if I, anytime I lift over five plates, that's pretty heavy for me where now I'm just focused on moving the weight. I'm not focused on, okay, let me make sure I drop my hips. Let me make sure they don't come up too high before the bar leaves the floor. But if I work at, if I use 315, that's heavy enough that it's actually gonna help me build strength progressively, but it's also light enough that I can just break it down into each individual component. I can spend time there. I can go, let me drop my hips. Now, I don't want the bar. I want the bar moving first and then my hips come up a little bit. I can think about things like that and then I can build it from there. Once that's comfortable where it's automatic, I don't have to think about it anymore. Now I can start increasing the weight and get back to where I am. So that's a really good point is if you go too light. Yeah, sure. What, like people that say it's all about technique. Yes, technique is extremely important. But at some point you have to put some real weight on you know, to build strength, to make progress. You want to build muscle and you want to build strength. It's not going to happen with super light weights. No, exactly. And, and one of the best ways, Mike, that I've found recently, because um, I read an article on this method called 3-7, where you take a weight that is, you warm up, and you take a weight that is your approximate 12 rep max. Right. Um, you go three reps, rest 15 so It's basically a form of rest pause, which that's another topic I wanted to address today. Yeah. You do three reps, you rest 15 seconds. You do four reps, 15. So 15-second rest until you get to seven 
Now, what I've found that is so valuable, and I'm using this a lot of my, especially my male clients now, my, um, you know, adult clients, and they're, they're, uh, I mean, the, it's not going to last forever, like nothing does, but I mean, the, the result right now, the feedback is really amazing on something so simple. You, the set of three mentally to go, I'm just doing three reps, and it's a relatively heavy weight. Obviously, a 12 rep max is not anything out of, you know, out of the, in, on, in the record books. Now, that being said, it allows you to progress, and I'll, and I'll explain how. So you do a set of three, and you do it more deliberately, where you're literally locked in going, mind, muscle, pay it, whether it's, uh, you take any exercise. I do it even with some of the um, basic um, compound lifts, and that basically everybody goes, no, don't do it with that, just do it with isolations, and that defeats the point of training, really. So, so you want to, you want to, you know, make sure that you're able to do it with now, certain exercises like a dumbbell press, having to get up and down off the bench. You, you waste too much energy. I found that that does not work. Right. It works well with machines. I saw you doing an incline press machine. It would work great yeah. with that. Yeah. You do your set of three and you're just locked in on mind muscle connection. Obviously, you're not close to failure. Set of four. When you get to your set of five, you start that five reps feels like a heavy set of five. With, with maybe three in reserve, two to three. But if you've ever trained the five by five, it feels like that set of five. Then your set of six, you're not even thinking about mind muscle. Now you're going, I'm, I'm moving the weight A to B for that six. Then if you chose the right weight to get to seven, you're going to hit failure or right short of it to get seven on that first round. You're going to do three rounds per exercise. But the key to this is, is it allows you to really pinpoint the mind muscle connection plus the just move it mindset, as well as there's a progressive component to once you can hit seven on that last set, which is a total of 25 reps, you increase the weight. Now, if it's too big of a jump, what I've found for anybody that knows this technique I've talked about, I'm mentioning here, you do your first three sets of three, four, and five with a heavier load then you slightly decrease to what you did your last workout for the sets of six and seven. So it's kind of an inc a small incremental increase. So there's a progressive overload to this that, you know, again, it's one of those things that's working really well right now until we get stale on it. But it, it does have a carryover to the dial in your technique because you're only doing that first set of three. Yeah. And I got to do 12 because we know if you do 12 reps with a 12 rep max, your first eight or nine reps is going to be pretty much just getting you to that point. You know, and that's why I don't like high rep training right. by itself because of that. There's just, there are too many phantom reps involved in that. And there, and that is wear and tear on your body. Yeah, it is. And there's too much wasted time to get to the reps that are your money reps. There you go. And that's the thing that also I've changed in the last 10 years in my own training. I'm 57 now. So for the last, Really since I was 45, is I've eliminated all those high rep, whatever I called them, warm up sets, prep sets, or whatever, so that I'm not putting all that wear and tear on my body. So I may do one, as an example. There's a study that came out in Brazil. Steve Holman, who was the longtime um, editor in chief with Iron Man magazine. Steve, oh, yeah. yeah, good guy, smart, intelligent, brilliant guy. Came out with all that positions of flexion work and everything. Yeah. And um, and he's 62, so he's in that range, um, kind of in that demographic that I'm in. And what he has found is he has a system where he does one high rep set, say 12 to 20 reps that, you know, I consider high reps. I don't consider doing reps, say, in the 30s and 40s really being a benefit. But yeah, that's the high rep set. And he takes that set not to failure, but within a rep or so failure. Then he rests. 15 to 20 seconds and does that rest pause. So that initial high rep set, just one, not, you're not doing that, repeating it. It knocks out the slow twitch fibers. So now his body in this study from in Brazil, I don't have it in front of me, but it actually is worth looking into. Your body taps into those type two fibers with the next subsequent sets. Now, some people go, oh, it sounds like myo reps or it, 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 all these different names for these types yeah. of systems. Yeah. Here, you know, it's it. But the thing is, it works. And um, does it work for everybody? No. And some people, their their mind just can't wrap its brain around doing 
one extended set. They've got to do a set and move on to the next and move on to the next. And that right. works. So it's not that it's better. But for those that want to eliminate the junk volume, that want to eliminate that, and hypertrophy is their goal. Now, this is, this is not for strength. This is purely for muscle hypertrophy, especially as you get older where you don't want to have to lift as heavy of a weight because your body recognizes those later sets as being heavier sets. So you're getting more effective reps that um, Chris Beardsley has called those reps within one to three reps proximity to failure. Yeah, Those, those are your money sets for muscle growth. Right. So it allows you to load the body with less absolute load, yet your muscles recognize that as being a heavy load. You know, once you get to where you can only do between two and four reps, you know, after, yeah, you're taking short, many breaks, but your body is tapping into those fast switch fibers. Now, you obviously you couldn't do that forever, but I think it's a really good way for someone to just kind of um, audit their training so that, they, so that they realize, wow, I've been doing four sets of, you know, 10 to 12. Well, I mean, think how much of that volume is literally just me getting to the buddy reps. Yeah, yeah. I like what you said about rest pause training, and I like the version of rest pause training you brought up because, interestingly enough, you brought up Steve Holman. I actually wrote an article on rest pause training for Ironman back in the day, early in my career. Now, the rest pause that I used was what Mike Menser recommended, Paul, Charles Poliquin recommended it. He called his cluster training, which is basically higher volume rest pause. So cluster training would be five sets of five done in rest pause style. So five reps rest pause style for five sets. And that stuff is extremely effective for short periods of time, let's say six weeks. And the reason is, is that it's, it's very fatiguing on your central nervous system. Now, these, when you first start doing these kind of workouts, you get almost a caffeine type high from it. You're so fired up neurologically after doing it. Feels amazing. And strength goes up big time within a couple of weeks. But over time, it starts burning you out. Now, the version you're talking about, though, is not anywhere near as as demanding on the central nervous system. But what I do like about rest pause is, is that you're starting off with those money reps. I mean, Mike Menser would do it, and Mike Menser was jacked in his day. He had an incredible physique and very strong bodybuilder. And he would do it where he would take 85 to 90% of his one rep max, and he used a lot of machines. So it's one rep, 10 to 15 second break, second rep, 10 to 15 second break, third rep. This is extremely effective for building strength, but he also found it very effective for building muscle. I think that, like you said, machines work really well for this style of training. Like you mentioned the incline press I do. That's perfect for this kind of thing because of the setup. This is actually perfect for deadlifts too. Just yeah. Pick it off the floor, put it down, do it again. If you if you were gonna do it with barbell squats, I would recommend doing it where you start at a 90 degree angle on the pins. You're just picking it up from the bottom, from the bottom position, just go up, lower it back down to the pins, 15 seconds, repeat again. That way there's not as much of that taking it off the pins, taking two steps back, having to rack it every 15 seconds. So I think this, this is a very effective methodology for the purpose of increasing strength. It can be used for increasing muscle, but I think the version that you brought up is very good for someone who is doing this for the first time, especially. Yeah, and um, actually, Steve calls this version that he's um, that he's coordinated and designed slow STX slow twitch exhaustion, and what that again yeah. is implying that you're exhausting the slow twitch fibers with that initial set. Right. Another, another way you can do this, for instance, you mentioned the barbell squat would not be ideal in something like this. But what you can do is implement, this is what I do with many of my clients, is I'll combine two exercises. So as an example, the pendulum squat I mentioned earlier, you can start with the bar, barbell squat and do your base, your initial base set, where you're doing a set of 12 reps. Let's, let's go 12 as opposed to 20. 12 repetitions, leaving a couple of reps in the tank. Then you go pendulum squat and do all of your little micro sets after that. Because that way, it, and what that does is it does not nail your nervous system as much especially right. targeting the quadriceps so you can combine exercises with this and then and that's one of those things where it's like there's so many different variations that we can use and, and everybody wants to try to um, market things they are like you know they have to call it names and all that and i don't yeah. really have a name for it i mean it's just to me it's yeah. 
literally something that makes sense in the in that for instance at this stage of my in my training life i don't want to have to use absolute load however i've always responded well when i say lower reps meaning reps in the say five to seven range i tend to i my, i just i don't like high reps even though i'm a smaller guy for the most part um I'm really fast switch, meaning that I'm not, I'm a sprinter. I'm not a runner. I mean, everything, I, I just abhor conventional cardio as an example, but I do intervals yeah. and I enjoy sprinting and, and so forth. So, I mean, it's my, and that's, that's a good sign for someone that goes, um, you know, my more fast switch or slow twitch. A lot of it is it, your psychology will reveal it to you because some people just the thought of sprinting, they'd rather go out and run for an hour, you know, and that's just, or, or walk for an hour and a half. And so with me, it's like, okay, well, how do I introduce those low rep, which my body recognizes as heavy at that stage? Well, you do that initial higher rep, and again, say 12 reps, and then you're doing those sets of two to four in addition to that. And then, but the thing is, there's a point of diminishing returns because if you do too much of that, number one, you've, I like to say five of those micro sets after, because if you can do more than that, then you show too light of a load for your base set because if you if i can do 10 12 reps and then 10 sets of four on top of that then you know you're what then you're wasting your time it's not oh man i'm doing more workload no you're not you're just you're not tapping in to those high threshold fibers that are so important for muscle growth right. so the point that you don't want to go so far in the other way but at the same time you don't want to hit a set of 12 and then rest 15 seconds and then only be able to do one and you hit failure. So there's a point where you have to experiment a little bit to find out what is the best for you. I mean, that um, the belt squat would be another great way to yeah. hit. Yeah. It's been for rest pause. I love it with pull-ups. Um, you know, I can there's a leg press I use at the gym, which is, it doesn't slide on pins. Basically you push it and it goes in that kind of direction. I've posted a clip of it. I, I'll send it to you if you don't know what I'm talking about. I, I think you've seen this. This is the first time I've ever used a leg press like that, and I love it. The rain, It feels basically like you're doing a squat. It feels really good. Now, this would be perfect for this style of training, too, because you just sit there, you do one heavy rep, rack it, 10 seconds, do another rep, and it's, you're in the perfect situation to do something like this. So I'm going to play around with some of these things with some of the moves I do for sure. Yeah, that th try that three seven. Experiment with that three seven method on those types of exercises because again, you're starting with a set of three, and then it, and if you're doing three sets, it allows you and you and you take two and a half minutes in between after you hit those twenty five reps. It it allows you to make the adjustments load wise if you need to because if you overshot, for instance, if you went three up to seven and you hit seven and you weren't at failure or even within a couple of reps of failure, you the load is too light. So what you do is you go, okay, I'm going to do my set two, but I'm going to increase the load. And you'll find you don't have to increase it much because again, the accumulation of volume is going to be there too, to hit your three, four, five, six, seven. Right. And I know people have experimented with coming down the ladder, so to speak, after, after the first set up. So then the next, next cycle through you do seven, six, five, four, three, two. What's, what's magical about three and seven? It just equals 25 reps. I mean, it's more about it because you don't want it to be, you know, 60 reps per set, because then again, you're not, you're not training, um, you're not training for strength or certainly not for muscle growth at that stage. The weight's not heavy enough. You want it to be in that 10 to 12. I find that even if it's a load of 10 reps, that, um, that, that works well too. And the, the heaviest I would go in a, in a, in a system like this would be um, say a 10 rep max and you stop at eight as an example. And then, and that would be your baseline from there. Cause some people that are more fast, switch. They'll yeah. find that's better than them trying to do 12 reps in that initial set. So there's um, you know, there's no perfect way of doing it. It's more the it's more the spirit of that method where you just look at it and go, okay, why am I doing this? Oh, to get more effective reps and less junk reps so right. that I wear and tear my body. It's not about anything magical about oh, I'm doing three, I'm doing seven. It's that you're you have to have you have to have some regulation, you know, with a number of reps in order to go outside that regulation. In other words, if you don't have any baseline and you just say, you know, do rest pause and okay, how do I do rest pause? Well, just do a set till you can't do anymore. And then just, yeah. a, you know, it's just, it's mind numbing. You know, there's nothing, there's yeah. nothing there 
to hold on to. So you want some regulation with it. A good way to start is at three seven. The other one is Mike. I mean, um, excuse me, Steve Holman's. Do that first set between 12 and 20 reps, depending on the exercise. Some exercises are more conducive to the higher reps. Then you hit within a rep of failure. Steve has come back, by, by the way, and said that he was pushing his body into failure too much with things like this. And he's backed off and gotten tremendous results for him at 62 by backing off a little bit in those earlier sets instead of thinking, I have to go to failure. So he's actually leaving a rep or two in, the, in reserve. Yeah. So what you do is you hit that initial set. Then you go, say, three subsets on top of that with that 15-second rest. The longest I would rest in this, because I know somebody's going to ask, well, what's magical about 15 seconds? The longest I would say is 20 seconds. Some people do tend to respond to that extra five seconds. The, le the least you should rest in rest pause is 10 seconds. I find if you do any less than that, then it, it's all endurance work then. Huh. Don't, you know, so you want you want to make sure you're really getting the quality of your work to get ramped up as opposed uh, to. I'll tell you what I did when I started it. When I first started playing around with rest pause, I found that 10, 15 seconds wasn't long enough. I wasn't prepared for that. So I would do one minute breaks and then I would do 50 second breaks the second time and then 40 second breaks at the third workout, 20 second breaks and then work my way down to 15 seconds. And when I could do five reps with 15 second breaks in between, then I would increase the weight and start over again at 60 seconds, 50 seconds, 40 seconds, 30 seconds. So that's one way to basically test the waters to gradually work into something like this. Because I'll tell you what, if you're not used to this style of training, first of all, a lot of people aren't even used to using 85, 90% of their one rep max. So let's start there. That's neurologically fatiguing. And if you're 10 seconds is nothing when you're not used to this style of training, taking 10 seconds, you're probably not even going to be able to do the second rep after 10 seconds. So you're going to, so you, your options are start lower than 90%. You can start at 85% and then do the 10 seconds or just do what I said. Point is, is that there's ways to play around with this. Don't get discouraged. If the first time you try this, you're going to, this is not a fit for me. No, it, it may not be a fit for you, but it, it's, but it's, but you can't use that first time trying it to determine whether that's the case or not. Yeah. And, and the other thing is, is that this really works well for those that have trained, say, for several years first. If, I wouldn't start somebody out. No, no, definitely not. Training like this because um, and then like those reps, the reps in reserve thing, there's no way for you to really um, assess your reps in reserve until you know how to go to failure, unless you right. really your body to that point. And so all the, you know, how many reps in reserve? Yeah, you know, I think two. I think there's no. Yeah. Thing. yeah. yeah. If that's the case, then you just you need more time in the saddle. You got to you got to you got to train longer to, before you start making adjustments um, in, in in workload like what we we're talking about. The um, and then it goes back to the guidelines. You've got to have guidelines in your training with numbers. You just don't use those numbers to identify. And I post a lot on this uh, to identify your training with. But without the guidelines, you you can't. You don't know when to go outside of them. It's, it's like I say, you know, you can't. You can't have a detour until you have a destination, you know, and people are always talking about, oh, I'm getting outside the box. And what, like, what are you, what are you expecting out of your training? Oh, uh, well, I mean, I, they have no, no, direct, no true direction in their training to begin with. They just go to the gym, you know, three, five times a week, and there's not any real direction. They're committed to going, so they show up, but until you have a real clear understanding of what your 12 RM is or what your five RM is. And, and you know, it just because of having trained enough with yeah. these guys, this is, this is, um, you know, it's a crap shoot at best. So it's better to just keep it, you know, with uh, regular straight sets until you get to the point, like you and I are talking about where you're like, okay, what do I do now that I've been training, you know, for 20 years, what can I do to introduce a, a workload that works? that I can also recover from. And um, that, that segues, there's one other thing, because um, I'm going off of what I talked with Steve about, Steve Holman. And, and, and thing, we have so much to cover in this brief time, that's the only reason I'm jumping. Eccentric reps. Everybody knows that eccentric reps are essential for producing the you know optimal um, line of hypertrophy or, or um, path of hypertrophy. That being said, there is, the reality they're tougher to recover from yeah As, you know, anybody that's ever done them for any length of time oh yeah um you know you mentioned christian thibodeau and i know he's um 
he's written on this and talked about it. It's they're very demanding, but they're not always the best way to go. Meaning that there are times that a faster eccentric is best. And why is that? Well, if it's more effective to do slower eccentrics, why not do slower eccentrics? Well, if you're not able to recover, it's more effective, but it's not more productive. Right. And there's a difference in effectiveness and productivity. Yeah. So, so something can be most effective, yet you're like, I'm not gaining any muscle. I'm not getting anywhere. I'm sore all the time. I'm getting injured. Right. Uh, you know, I just, I'm not making any progress. I'm, I'm weaker. And it's because your training is effective, but it's not productive in the sense where you don't want to do all of your reps with slow eccentrics. You want to find ways that you can continue to train and be able to recover. So select one exercise that you do two or three sets with eccentric accentuation. And then the rest of your training for that particular area, that particular body part, you know, don't, don't emphasize the negative, you know, go faster on the negative. And in spite of it not being as effective at producing muscle growth, it allows you to recover for muscle growth. No, it's so true. When I started working on Nordic curls, I really accentuated the negative. Now for two reasons. One, I couldn't do the concentric. So the first goal is, can I lower all the way down without that drop, without flopping? Because you see a lot of people, they're just lowering and they're just flopping at the bottom and then they push themselves off. Okay, that's that's okay initially just to get the just to get started, but you're not gonna work up to a concentric rep rep if you can't even control the negative portion of it. So I worked up to a point where I could lower under 10 seconds. But here's the problem with that. It that that fatigues you so much you have nothing to try to come back up. So the next goal is let me lower a little bit faster so I'm not burning a lot of energy, and then I'll just do a partial and then come right back up. So now what I'm doing is I'm not doing super slow negatives anymore. I can already do that. I already know I can do that. Now the goal is to lower under control, but quickly enough that I get to where I want to go and I can use that stretch reflex to come right back up. So it's just, it just depends on where you are with things. Now, look, when I get to the point where I can do five reps really easy, yeah, sure. I can say, okay, let me do slower negatives, pause at the bottom, come back up, but I'm not there yet. So I don't need to find all these intensification methods at this stage in the game. The negatives were very useful though, because I'll tell you what, if someone only does negatives on the Nordic curl, they never work up to a concentric, but they can lower under control. That is tremendous for your hamstrings and your knee integrity. Even if you never work up to a concentric rep, just the ability to lower is really useful. Now, if you can lower partially and come back up, that's also really useful. Even if you never work up to a full repetition, all of these progressions along the way are very effective. So it's good to have all these different tools in your toolbox to pull from. You know, negatives is not the be all end all where it's going, you know what, from now on, I'm just going to do negatives at the gym. I'm not going to do the concentric at all. That's that's taking something that's good way too far. You know, there's a time and place for everything. Yeah. And I mean, it, and you, as far as the Nordic curl, you'll find, as I'm sure you already have, is that for everybody, everybody's body, there's or everybody's particular physiology, there's a certain part of that range of motion that is. You can call it the sticking point where you just you just don't have the strength. And then what you do by emphasizing, you'll be able to find and detect where that is. Because if you just learn a way to bypass it, you don't get that um, that knee health integrity that you're speaking of because you're not really developing the hamstring in its full span of strength curve. So when you're in, in glutes um, with that. So the point is, especially the hamstring with the knee flexion, but the point is, is that when you go, you use negatives as a tool instead of it being always. And again, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I was one that for years said everything's slow negatives. You got to slow the negative down. You got to slow the negative down. You need tension on the eccentric phase. If you don't, you're not doing it right. And so I've matured with my view of that. Not It's not about, you know, oh, I was wrong and now I'm admitting it. It's more about going, OK, that is more effective. However, if you can't recover from that, is it more productive? Right. Oh, so it's, right. it's, you know, so it goes right back to, you know, the, the thing, you know, with people saying, well, don't do cardio, don't do intervals, don't walk, don't do this because it cuts into your recovery time. And I'm like, okay, but then there is such your cardiovascular health too, uh, yeah, yeah. circulatory health and all that. And so, so 
yeah, it may be more effective to not do any cardio. It may be more effective just to sit on your butt after training and before training. I mean, you know, theoretically, but it is not more productive. Yeah, you want, you want to be healthy too. I mean, what's the point of being strong if you're not healthy? You know, I do 10,000 to 15,000 steps with my dog every day, seven days a week without fail, you know, in addition to my workouts. Now that actually, people look at walking, they kind of laugh about, it. but I'll tell you what, you walk as much as we do, not only does it, will you notice a decrease in body fat, and you will notice an increase in cardiovascular health and heart health. But I find I actually have to eat more because otherwise I start losing too much weight. I actually have to make sure I get extra meals in because of this high level of activity. And this is in addition to the four workouts I do. But many people who love the train, they make the mistake of not having much activity in their life. They get their three to four workouts in, but then their activity is zero. They're, they're watching Netflix for four hours every night. They're, because, they're, because they have a paranoia that you're talking about going, no, I can't go hiking on the weekend because that's gonna take away from my workout. That's taking it to an extreme that's not healthy, in my opinion. The whole point of being strong and fit is that so you can be more active, at least in my opinion, that's carrying over to real world activities. If, if walking every day is, if you think walking every day is gonna detract from your workouts, then you got a bigger problem than the walking, that's for sure. Yeah, and you know, there's no better walking partner than a dog. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's what. Um, you know, the, it, it goes right back to this as well. You know, I think a lot of people don't do activities outside of training because they perceive it as, you know, I've got to, I've got to be in that war mindset for my work. I got to, I've got to save all my energy up. And I, and again, speaking from experience, I understand where that comes from. Yeah. Yeah. And and so, when your workouts become a, another job, and they become literally something you dread having to do. Right. There's there's the problem. And the thing is, it's usually not that they hate training. It's the fact that they have too many have to's in their training. Too many. I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do that. Instead of you got to keep a level of fun in your training. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the commitment is the commitment itself. It's not. OK, I'm committed to training, but then I got to do all these things that like we, go, like we talked about earlier. Hate this exercise. I hate that exercise. <laughs> You can't because it'll affect other areas of your life. Even if you show up and do all that you hate, there's a point where it's going to you're going to be you're going to have a shorter temper. You're going to be you're going to, you know, especially if you have to, you know, God forbid, miss a workout because then you <laughs> beat yourself up over it because you didn't go do all the things you hate doing. So yeah. you stop being absolutely miserable because you had to miss that great opportunity. So yeah. that, I found that that is something that's so important. To understand if you want training to positively impact all aspects of your of your life and this again this is not this is symbolic training is a microcosm of life to a large extent i mean a lot of what we do in training and our workouts you transition it when you're doing it in a, in a mature healthy way it transitions to to life you handle imperfection i mean you go in and you go man, I was really hoping to hit a PR today in this or whatever PR is. But the point is, I was hoping to perform well in that exercise. God feels really crappy today. OK, fine. Either maybe transition to another exercise and just leave that one for next time or just scale it back. Have the maturity to be able to scale the load back and right. deal, deal with the imperfection and just say, OK, because that, again, will allow you to sustain a productive path of training more so than it is to just put your head down and be pissed off at the world and you know be determined regardless of how you feel whether you're gonna you're gonna hit that number today or you're gonna do that exercise today or if you're gonna come and somebody's on the piece of equipment that you want to start on and <laughs> throw you off i mean then then your perfect workout's over now because you know <laughs> they're there and you know it's just i mean a lot of people need to hear that because um, they feel like if I don't have those expectations, then I'm not all in. You know, if I don't have those expectations to to be at 100 percent, regardless of what my day's been, then I'm 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 not hardcore. I'm not all you know about it. Yeah, you are. The fact that you're going to continue to train for the rest of your life. That's where your commitment is. OK, and then from there, and again, I've got a 95 year old client and that we've talked about many times before and uh -huh. for you know, and he's still going. And have I had to scale his workouts back? Absolutely. You know, training for 25 years. But the point is, is that he's still consistent. It's consistency. And where the commitment is more than it is you trying to have this marker of I need to do this or else. 
to determine whether it's a productive workout. Because yeah. you're only as good as your next workout, not this one. This one is leading into your next one. You've got to recover from this one in order to get to the next one because you're not going to get all the muscle stimulation you need from this workout today. Yeah. Part of it. But it's not like you can just crush yourself today and go, done, over with, now I've, I've completed it. I'm fit. Yeah. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work like that. And that's the thing that's like life too, symbolic in the sense of where, you know, yeah, I want to snap at that person. They've been a real jerk. They're being, you know, okay. But then you've got to, what happens after you do that? Okay. I mean, what happens in the aftermath? And that's the same thing with workout. You look at it as I'm going to go in with expectations. Oh, didn't hit my expectation. But the thing that we also know, Mike, when you hit those expectations, that can be a bad day too, because yeah. then, Go and what am I going to do now? It can feel really anticlimactic. You're absolutely correct. Sometimes you sometimes the worst thing for your motivation is actually achieving the goal because now now you can wonder okay what am I supposed to do now and you actually lose motivation to keep training. A lot of people just let themselves go. I mean, we see that with Olympic athletes. They work so hard to fine tune their to, to their body for a very specific task. And once it's achieved, they have no motivation to just maintain anything. Now they're going to they just let themselves go. Someone like Mike Mentzer I brought up, after he after he retired from bodybuilding, he let himself go completely. He started smoking two packs a day, Marlboros. He had a big gut. He didn't work out at all. He started eating junk food because he said, I felt so restricted for so long. Now, finally, I can just live it up. But that, to me, is missing out on the whole point of starting the lifestyle in the first place. But that, that can happen when you take things to an extreme. Now you go in the opposite extreme. Yeah, and then, but, but most of us that have trained for any length of time, I don't think we have the concern of not taking it serious enough. Yeah. I mean, really, yeah. I mean you're not, you're probably not going to go to the gym and do the step aerobics class. Instead <laughs> of I mean, it's not like somebody's got to say, Hey Mike, no, no, th go that door. Not that one. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, it's not like what you, you learn your commitment level when you go through really difficult times. I mean, last year I had to put two dogs down and my father died. He had a heart attack in November. Now that happened in a three month time span. Now, I was very depressed, not depressed because that's different than sadness. I had a lot of sadness. I deal with depression. That's separate. But what I will say is that even though I had no motivation to train, it's a habit. So just like I brush my teeth every day, whether I feel like it or not, just like I eat dinner every day, whether I feel like it or not, I'm going to get those workouts in whether I feel like it or not. Now, was I chasing PRs? Absolutely not. Was I excited about training? Absolutely not. But I got it in every single time and every single time I felt better. And it's really important to maintain. There's no time that it's more important to maintain these ha maintain these habits, these healthy habits, than when you're going through a really difficult period. Whether it's a divorce, whether it's a death of a loved one, whether you had to put a dog down, whether you got fired from your job, doesn't matter what it is. Those are the times where it's even more important to maintain that commitment to training. Don't worry about PRs. Don't worry about whether you're excited or not about it. Just get it in, because I promise you. If you go three months without training because you're not motivated and then you finally go back in, you're going to be so mad at yourself because you're going to, you let yourself go. You're going to be so weak. Your body's going to be so tight and it's, you can get it back, but why let yourself degrade to that point? Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's exactly what you said. It's better to be consistent and be in control of those days that you back off or those days right. that you go in, you know, with lower expectations than it is to just quit all together and then then it's easy to come back you know from nothing then i mean you know, but the, i say easy because you know, you're starting from you know you feel you know exhilarated to get back at it but you lost all that time you lost all that time that you could have been sustaining that path and then now you've got to spend all that time just to get back up to speed so to speak so so there's you know that that point the maturity of being able to say i'm not i mean we all have that image that we think that we whatever you know somebody's you know, more like if somebody comes up and says, hey, man, I'm more dedicated than you in my workout. I mean, I mean, what? I mean really, I mean, where, that is so subjective and, you know, for anybody to ever, you know, think about anyone. And I think we all have that tendency to want to make sure we're pushing ourselves, you know, but it's like somebody's always going to be pushing themselves harder than you. I mean, there's always going to be, there's going to be an Olympic athlete. There's always going to be yeah. something yeah. that so to get into that comparison thinking, I think right. it's. A lot of people get derailed as opposed to just walking in and going, hey, it's today and I'm going to get the most of today. And that's not being weak. That's not you settling for less. In essence, you're probably going to be stronger that day 
as long as you've been training for a length of time. For a beginner, that's not true. A beginner needs to be pushed. They need to be told, you need to put that on the bar. You need to show up. You need to be here again on Wednesday. You know, they need that, okay? Yeah. When you've been in it for this length of time, don't beat yourself up like that. You've got to look at it purely from, I'm going to have fun with this. I'm going to, yeah, there are days that I'm literally not going to have my A game, but I'm going to have as much of what, if I have my B game, I'm going to be 100% with my B game today, you know, as an example. Yeah. That's perfect. And that's a great place to end. I know you have to go now. I'm going to put your website and your Instagram info right there in the bio because it's going to be on YouTube so everyone can find out your stuff. Thanks again for all the time, man. It's always a pleasure talking to you. I always pick up a lot of good information. And I'm going to go ahead and stop recording, make sure we don't lose this.